the splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. In grand and wealth in light, and darkness tries to hide, he trembles at his voice, we tremble at Our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hand, beginning and the end, beginning. Today too. We're glad you've come. It's a very special day for us uh, and for Jefferson. He'll tell you more why it's even more special to him in a moment. But um, we're going to have a prayer of consecration in a few minutes. I'll ask anyone who would like to come up. Um, I'm going to have Jefferson standing where I am. So you can, if you don't want to climb the stairs and be behind him, you could come right beside us here. We'll all put our hands on him. And we'll all pray a prayer of consecration. Uh, it's been exciting for me to have God bring him into my life. And he says that he's glad that I came into his life too. So I'm glad to hear that. It's been a wonderful journey. Uh, it's helped us already in many ways. And it's helped him also. And we're just thankful to be uh, in life together, in ministry together. I want to, uh, first of all, say his title is assistant pastor. He has an office down the hall, end of the hall on the right-hand side. Um, he um, also has a second title of uh, communications director. And I thought this morning, and um, this came to my heart, unless we all pull in the same direction, we'll just pull apart. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the Lord said, come apart and rest a while. And then somebody said, well, if you don't come apart and rest a while, you'll just come apart. And the same is true when it comes to organization. We have to all work together. And there's many, many moving parts of this living organism, the church. It's not just an organization. It is a living organism of Christ, his body. 
He's the head and we're the body. And so I want to encourage you, all of our uh, workers and uh, every committee and leadership team, we all want to communicate together with uh, Jefferson, myself. And um, further down from there, we have, we have David as our worship leader. We have other uh, committees of planning committees and activities committees and people involved in greeting and all kinds of jobs. And we all are needing to make sure we're all coordinating and pulling together in the same direction. So you'll be getting either texts or emails or some kind of memo from all of us to each other as we go forward with Jefferson as a new director in all of these ministries. Every relationship rises or falls on communication, and we must always seek to communicate with each other. I want to read a passage and uh, then ask Jefferson to come up. And anyone who would like to come up and put hands on him, some lining up behind him, some beside him. Paul had a helper. His name was Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul said this to Timothy. My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, men and women, who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, Timothy, must endure hardship. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And then chapter 4, he concludes, I charge you. It's like a, a commissioning. It's like a consecration, a dedication. I charge you, therefore, before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables. But you, watch, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. And those are the commissioning words to the younger Timothy. And uh, they are from my heart as well to Jefferson, my friend, my co-laborer, fellow pastor, teacher. Yes, he's still a missionary. <laughs> and always will have the heart of a missionary. But every missionary is a pastor and every pastor is a missionary. And I'm so thankful. Jefferson, would you come up right now? He's going to share a testimony before we call for the people to come and lay hands on him. This is a very significant day to him. And uh, he's going to tell you more about it. Okay, good morning, everyone. Don't forget, we are all answers of prayer. You are here because someone prayed for you. And we are a community that we belong to each other because we were saved by the same blood, the blood of Christ. Amen. And now we have everything we need and actually more than you need, than I need. I like when Carl comes and he says, Jefferson, how are you doing? And I say, better than we deserve. <laughs> and he just said, yes, I agree. 
It's always better than we deserve. Amen. And about 17 years ago, the day yesterday, the 4th of March, my dear wife, she said, yes, I will get married with you. So it's been 17 years that she is walking with me. And she's more than I deserve. And also, here I have Brent and Bonnie, uh, Bonnie. And I remember when I received the news, where I will stay the next couple years. When the church arrives, they said, we don't have the paperwork to help you, Jefferson, to get your R1. And I remember Brent being in contact with my friend here, Pastor Big. And it took a few weeks for him to read the, the text. <laughs> And to put action, but it was in God's time because in that day when he came was the day I prayed. And here's a verse that I want to leave with you. Uh, write it down. Put in your heart. Because this is our confidence. Look what John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us. Amen. Do you believe in that? Yes. You see, now. It's not yesterday. It's not tomorrow. It's not uh, in a few minutes. Now. I like that. It's right now. doesn't matter what you are going through right now. Now. We have this confidence. This word will never get older or how you say out of fashion. Right. Never. It's now. And that's why I urge you to pray for me now. That tomorrow and all the days that will come, I will continue to walk in my call, which is to be faithful to share the good news with those who are lost. Amen. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Pastor. This is all I have. Amen. All right, if you'd like to go ahead and stand right here yes. in the center. If you'd like to come up and come around this side, um, we'll lay hands on, on Brother Jefferson and pray. Anybody that wants to do that. We might have to have you back up a little bit there, buddy. Yes, thank you. It looks like a crowd. If you can't reach him, just put hands on uh, the person next to you and we'll all be connected. How's that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for Jefferson. And we pray, Lord, that you would place your blessing on him even further than you have thus far. We know, God, his call and his salvation, his service overseas and back in his home country, we're thanking you for bringing him to America, for his family, his wife and sons. Bless them too as they are united in heart and in faith. And help, Lord, as he serves here for us all to look to him and love him and listen to him and follow many of the things you bring to us from his heart. As he will seek your heart and I will seek your heart. And then each of us in this congregation seeking your heart. Help us all to communicate together. To pull together. For we know that we're yoked together with you, O oh God. Just bless him in this installation day as he consecrates himself to the work of the ministry at this beautiful, wonderful church. Amen. And Lord, I pray that we will see more souls saved and 
we will grow more spiritually, numerically, and in every way, Lord, have your blessing upon us. Thank you for this great day. Bless him, we pray, and bless us too, that we will be a blessing to the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you, Jefferson. Jesus came.
came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Buzz of joy o'er my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell in the city I know since Jesus came into my heart I'm so happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Walking down the King's Highway Tell me the old, old story I love him better every day Hallelujah I will make you fishers of men If you'll only follow me Hallelujah What a Savior I'm from sin set You're from sin set We're all from sin set free what a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer We often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer and temptation Is there trouble anywhere? It should never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in pain Can we find a friend so fair? Jesus knows our every week Take it to the Lord in prayer Are we weak and heavy laden? 
Comfort with the Lord of care Precious Savior still our refuge Take it to the Lord in prayer And do thy friends this wise for sin I thought as we were consecrating uh, Jefferson into the ministry here, it give us all an idea of what this idea is. It's the same word consecrate is, is sanctify. It means to uh, set apart for holy use. Uh, it means to become holy. As we uh, learn how that is, we, we'll, we'll see that we can actually be holy because he's holy. We can be dedicated because he dedicated himself to the church in giving his life. And this verse here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 23. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body you see, we're a trinity as well. Your whole spirit, soul, and body, may it be sanctified. 
preserved blameless, here he says, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you would, slip back to Galatians chapter 5. Walking in the Spirit this morning, Galatians chapter 5. As we are consecrated and set apart, made holy, this is how it happens. Galatians 5, read along with me, starting at verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not the things that you wish. But... If you are led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, and contentions. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies. Envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If or since we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The question is asked, why do people feel so unfulfilled why are people so unhappy even people with fame and fortune and everything still why are they so miserable so hopeless many people are looking in all the wrong places for meaning you see God has put Actually, God made you for a certain purpose. Did you know that? He was all by himself. And he made man, and he walked every evening in the cool of the day, fellowshipping with us, with mankind. But sin has destroyed that. Sin is, our spirit died. When mankind sinned, people look all over the place for, for fulfillment, for happiness, for meaning, for purpose. They look in empty places like sensuality, selfishness, materialism, even religion. Even many Christians feel so unhappy. Shouldn't be. Why do we feel so unhappy? What is it? What's the reason? Many live conflicted and defeated and unhappy lives. I read this statistic that said, we some, sometimes say a person is not what he used to be. And physiologically speaking, it's accurate, an accurate statement. And here it is. Every minute, five million cells in the human body are destroyed, die, and are replaced. That's a lot of cells every minute. The physical miracle of renewal takes place without personal awareness. But here it is. Spiritual renewal requires constant, vigilant, 
passionate purpose for Christ. John 6, 63 says, it's the spirit that gives life. This morning, I want to suggest to you that this uneasiness, un, unhappiness, even in us as believers, has to do with consecration, dedication, and sanctification. Paul wrote here in the book of Galatians to help us. He prayed that their whole body, soul, and spirit would be sanctified, set apart for, made holy. And this morning I want to talk about that from chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. First of all, we see the conflict of the flesh and spirit. There's a conflict that happens between the flesh and spirit. When you're born, you're born dead, spiritually. Your spirit is dead, Paul said, because of sin. We're not going to write all of these scriptures, but you who know your Bibles know the Bible says you're born in trespasses and in sins. You're dead, spiritually speaking. You're, you're walking dead, man. You know, the shows that they all come out with now, there's some truth to it, I guess. Because people who are not saved are walking dead people. They have a soul and they have a body, but their spirit is dead. So to talk of any kind of spirituality is just talk. There has to have something happen. You have, you have a human nature that you were born with. And, and this idea of the flesh has to do with, first of all, two natures. Christian, I'm talking to you now, when, when you get saved, you're born of the Spirit of God. John chapter 3 and verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We do know that, that we have a body, but there's also another terminology here. The word flesh doesn't just mean our physical bodies in the New Testament. Many, many times, it does refer to that, but many, many times it's referring to our fallen, sinful, human, Adamic, from Adam, nature. And in that nature, we have a desire for the things that he writes in this passage, the works of the flesh. Jesus told Nicodemus about this uh, experience of a new birth in John chapter 3, and he, he told him, you must be born again. He, he told him about the flesh and the spirit. The saved person, when you get saved, your spirit comes alive, and then you receive a new nature. Look at 2 Peter 1 verse 3 and 4. It says there, as his divine nature, or divine power rather, has given to us all things that pertain to life. Why are we so unhappy? He came that we might have life, and more abundantly, he said. And it's in this divine nature, notice, he said, and godliness, that through these, through his power and his uh, godliness, that through these we have been made, notice, through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. So we're seeing a conflict in this passage between the flesh, the human sinful nature, and the spirit, the divine nature, and the Holy Spirit of God that's in you. John 6 and verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. And so there's these two natures within you. And the one you listen to is the one who, the one you, you uh, serve will be the one that will either give you life or bring you death. Jesus said, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Even Christians, sometimes you're unhappy 
Because you're trying to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. You're trying to do what only God can do in you. I've told you many times, you cannot live the Christian life in the flesh. You can't. In your old nature, you can't. In your own will, in your own strength, in anything to do with you, without him, you can do nothing. He told in the book of John's, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. No thing. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that. And we keep trying to serve God with our own strength and our own will. And that's why you're unhappy, because you can't do it. You're, you need to understand these two natures. They lead to, secondly, two choices. Two choices, verse 25. He said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And what he's saying is, you've been made alive in this Holy Spirit. When you got saved and you received this new divine nature, opposite the human Adamic nature, this nature is in Christ. It's assisted by the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. And as you let your spirit confer with his spirit, you will understand that you are son of God, a daughter of God, and you'll, you'll be walking in that. If you've been made alive, he said, then make sure you're walking in it. That tells us you can be saved and not be walking in the Spirit. You can be alive in the Spirit, but not walking in the Spirit. Then what are you walking in? Well, there's only two. You're either walking in the Spirit or you're walking in your old nature. That's stimulated by everything around you, led, I mean, the whole world is following this old nature, this fallen nature. And when you and I uh, yield to that world system and that world view, when you and I are influenced by the demonic world of demons that want you to follow the world, He's the prince in the power of the air, and they want you following his prince. Oh, but we're to follow the prince of princes. Amen? That's why we're conflicted, because there's two choices. First of all, walk in the Spirit. Keep on walking, verse 16. The literal Greek means keep on walking. Uh, verse 25, keep in step with is what is literally in the Greek. You need to keep in step with the Spirit. And you won't keep in step with the Spirit if you're walking in the flesh. You'll be out of step with God. That'll make you unhappy too. That'll bring guilt and, and that'll bring all kinds of things in your life that will just make you miserable. You know, the most miserable people in the world are Christians who are not walking in the Spirit. Many times the unworld, the unsaved rather, the, in the world, they, they, they're unhappy, but they're not as un unhappy as you are because they've got so many other things that they put into their lives. That, but when they get alone and when they get quiet and when there's no other influence around, it's just them and their heart and God, they know they're lost and they know they're empty. They know they're dead. So you, Christian, you, you can keep, keep on walking. In, in other words, verse 16, it, literally, walk in the Spirit. Keep on walking. It, you, can, you can subsist from doing it. You, you can get sidetracked. There's so many other things that will draw your attention away from And you'll forget that you cannot have the power of God and the holiness of God and the, and the passion and love and all these things we're going to study of love in the weeks to come, the fruit of the Spirit. So two choices, walk in the Spirit or number two, walk in the flesh. Those who live according to the flesh, here's the, here's the secret, live according to the flesh, what do they do? Set their minds on the things of the flesh. What I just described. Those who live according to the Spirit, they set, it's not set, says that, but the, he's saying they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So you either are 
conforming your mind to the things of the flesh, the old nature, the world, the devil, or you're conforming your mind, Romans 1, 12, 1 and 2, to the things of the Spirit. That would have been a good verse to put in there too. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so, the two results of that, letter C, death and displeasure. We'll find ourselves in either of these categories, either states of mind, if we're walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh. Because there's a conflict between the two and they never can uh, be con reconciled. Life and peace or death and displeasure. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 7 and 8. Here it is. Because the carnal, and that, that corresponds to the fallen human nature of Adam, that stills in you, the carnal mind is enmity. It's against, it's opposite, against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. And here's what I told you earlier, you can't serve God in the flesh. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He's not saying if you're in the body, you can't please God, you know. No, he's saying if you're in the flesh, walking in the flesh. He goes on in that same verse, the next verse to say, but you're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in you, Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says. And so there's two results the new nature cannot sin is something that we maybe need to explain as well. Look at 1 John 3, 9. It says, whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed, the seed of the word of God, the seed of the Holy Spirit, the seed of this new nature, for his seed remains in him. Notice this. Some people misinterpret it. He cannot sin because he's been born of God. Some Christians have taken that and said, oh, I, I, you know, I, I should never sin again once I get saved. That's not possible. Unless you can all the time, always, without fail, walk in the Spirit. What that verse is really teaching you is that your new nature, your Holy Spirit that lives in you, cannot sin. If ever you sin, it's because you have turned from this nature and this spirit and you are walking in, you're, you're listening to, you're setting your mind on the things of the old nature, the fallen nature. Say, why didn't God just take the nature out of us when we got saved? I don't know. <laughs> Would have been great. But we're growing through faith. We are learning to, to subdue this old nature. We're, we're showing God that we love him so much, we want to say no to ourselves and yes to his Holy Spirit. So, when we sin, we're yielding to the flesh because this new nature can't sin. The Holy Spirit cannot sin. You do not do the things you wish, he said here in verse 17. Let's look at what he said in Romans chapter 7. This is a good chapter to help you explain it. Look back in your Bibles. Turn with me. Romans chapter 7. It says in verse 18 of Romans chapter 7. This is the great apostle Paul, who probably was one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. This is what he said regarding this old nature and this new nature, this struggle between the flesh and the spirit. He said, in verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not do, to do that I practice. Now if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin, but this old nature 
that dwells in me, is what he's saying. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Here's the answer. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. What he's saying is that these two natures are so opposed to each other. And there is a war going on within us. And that this nature of, of Adam can never do good. It can never be sinless. But this nature that's of God, that's divine, that's aided by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word and the holy people of God, they can never sin in that nature. But the secret is walking in that nature. And again, the more you walk in that nature, the less you will sin. You will never always walk in that. You will, you will fail and you'll learn from your faith. God will let you fail many times. He'll let you make wrong choices. He'll let you be disappointed. He'll let you be unhappy so that you can see that my only happiness is walking closer to him. To live in that spirit is one thing. To walk in that spirit is another and he's telling us, make sure you're walking in that spirit. Ask yourself the question, who am I following? Am I following my mind and my own heart and my own will? Am I following all the people in the world that are looking for things in all the wrong places? Am I listening and letting everything around me? Because I'm telling you, we are bombarded, Christians, bombarded with this old world nature. And the more you isolate or insulate or, or regulate yourself away from that, the more you walk in the Spirit, the happier you will be. I've never been more happier than when I'm walking in the Holy Spirit of God. There's joy. Peace. All the things I'm going to show you in the weeks ahead from this idea of the fruit. Works of the flesh are plural. Fruit of the Spirit is singular. It's something that comes only from God. Not by you practicing love and joy and peace. No, it's fruit. It comes naturally as you walk in the Spirit. True Christians, verse 21, look at that. Verse 21, true Christians will not practice sin. True Christ, a Christian who's walking in the Spirit... The Spirit of God can never sin. The divine nature can never sin. It cannot sin. That's the seed of God. Jesus prayed, and this is another secret in my mind. I've never heard anybody interpret this passage this way, but it's how God has brought it to my heart when Jesus said in John 17, verse 11. Jesus said in John 17, 11, now, I am no longer in the world, but these, he's praying to the Father. It's a great fatherly prayer. I'm no longer in the world. He's standing there with his disciples around him. But these are in the world. I come to you. It's going to happen. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. Notice this. It's very important that they may be one as we are. Again, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus did always those things that pleased the Father. He never sinned because he always walked in the Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure. The Spirit had him without measure. You and I aren't always filled with the Spirit. We're walking in ourselves. Or in our society, our culture. Jesus' desire was that you and I, some people interpret this, that all Christian denominations would be one. I don't believe that's what he's teaching. I believe what he's teaching is that every believer, every individual person 
would have their body and their soul and their spirit in oneness with God. As we walk in that oneness, we will definitely not fulfill the desires of the, of the flesh. That's the goal. That's the bar. Do I ever hit it? Not yet. <laughs> I've never hit it yet. I mean, there are times and seasons in my life where I've, I'm more in the Spirit. I'm more walking with God. I'm not in my flesh. Right now, even, I'm experiencing a new a renewal that, that's happening, I think, because, because of a, a, a greater desire to see the church grow and myself to grow. Yes, I've been a Christian since I was six years old and studied the Bible since I was 19, but I think there's more to come. And I'm excited about it because God's doing a new work in my heart. And I want that for all of us, too. And I see it in you. I see you getting excited. I see it. I think God sees it. Do you feel it? I was talking to a guy the other day, and he says, man, I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Sometimes when you're in that spirit, you'll get goosebumps in the, in the body. <laughs> Oneness with God. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely. Here's the goal. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, body, blameless. Preserve blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The last point the characteristics of the flesh and spirit. We're just going to point these out because we're going to be studying it in the, in the weeks to come. The characteristics of the flesh and the spirit. The categories of sin. He talked of them in verses 19 through, through uh, 21, where he says the categories are sexual sins. Verse 19 and verse 21. Look at there. The word there is uh, um, adultery, fornication. They're, they're very similar in that one is usually used with married people who are unfaithful. The other, fornication, is usually used with people who aren't in a marriage relationship but are in a physical relationship with somebody. That's fornication. Sensual sins. The Greek word is pornea. We get the word pornography from it. And, you know, you can be in this sensual sin without even having a physical relationship with somebody. And I want to warn you, more and more and more, you're going to see pornography just rampant on the internet and everywhere else in people's lives. And, and it will destroy you. It will destroy your family and your home. Pornea. The word uncleanness is all forms of immorality. Debauchery is lewdness and lasciviousness. Drunkenness and revelries, which is orgies. Drinking parties and sexual parties. And it was associated in the Old Testament as well with false worship in, in wicked orgies of ungodliness. Romans 13.13 13 says... Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry, in drunkenness, lewdness, lust, not in strife and envy. These are sexual sins. Then there's sensual sins. In verse 20, idolatry is something related to um, covetousness. Colossians 3, 5 says... Therefore, put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Notice, which is idolatry. People are going to be turning to all kinds of religiosity and uh, all kind of materialism, all kind of, of things in this world to find happiness but they won't find it. You're not going to be happy with money. You won't be happy with free sex and open sex and free marriage and all, this, all the same. The world thinks you will. The world thinks you'll be not only happy, but 
if you want, you can find happiness in, in choosing a gender that that's, makes you happy. Choosing a sexuality that makes you happy. No, God set up the way it was, male and female, and, and how to be happy in marriage, and how to be having a home, and how to propagate the world with, with God through our lives. The word sorcery is the word pharmacia. This is interesting. Pharmacia. We get the word uh, pharmacy from it. Drug. Many times in, the, in those wicked, sinful witchcraft and putting trances, I've seen it. I've literally seen it when I was in Haiti. I, I, I believe I saw it in Africa as well, where people are taking potions of a kind, some kind of drugs that alter their minds, that open their spirit, that fills them with the devil and demons. And the Bible warns us that as the end approaches, there's going to be more and more of that demon activity, and there'll be more and more drugs. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there can be some good in drugs. I'm not saying that all pharmacies are of the devil. They're rich, let me say that. But God gave mankind these plants, these things, these, this knowledge to be able to help you. I'm not saying that, you know... You just quit taking your insulin? Don't do that. That's foolishness. God can use a lot of the, the drugs that are in the world to help you. I take a drug every day to make sure my heart is, my blood pressure is not too high. Right now it feels pretty high, but I took my, I took my medicine this morning. But I'm excited about this message. and I'm almost done. These are the last points. She said, preach on, I'm gonna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Pharmacia. Be careful what drugs you take into your body. Be careful. There are some things, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some CBD that's helpful, but you take too much of it, or if it has other things in it besides just certain parts of that plant, you will, you will find yourself thinking differently. Drugs. Pharmacia, sensual evils, sensual applying to our feelings and our senses and, and, and that kind of thing. Walk properly. Then um, the final one there is societal evils, verse 20 and 21. These have to do with, with your relationship with people around you. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, fits of rage. You know, we see that. I, I used to ask the Lord, God, if, if I have your Holy Spirit, how come I can't control my tongue? How come I can't control my anger? How come I, I don't have any self-control, Lord, when it comes to my anger? And, you know, I'm getting a handle on it more and more because I know it's because I've been walking in that flesh. If I get closer to the Lord in, in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, He controls my tongue. He can. I can't control my tongue. But God can. And that goes with everything you're fighting in your lives. What is it? it? Maybe it's not your anger and it's not your tongue. It's something else for you. Maybe some of these things that we've read here, I don't know. God knows. But I want you to know the happiness and the peace and the victory and the joy. It's not going to come by you trying harder. It's going to come by you trusting more. Not in yourself, but in the Spirit. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, which is heresy, factions. You know, the, the more we get on fire for God, the more the devil's going to be upset with this church. And the one thing that I really want you to be aware of is that don't get a, 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 a factious a, a mentality. Don't us and them. Don't, don't, it's... It's not about the old and the young. It's not about the, you know, the, the, the man or the woman. It's, it's not about my little 
uh, group or your little group, we're all in this. Don't let strife and division and backbiting and, and, and pulling in different directions, don't let any of that happen because that's not of God, that's of the flesh. Who gets the glory? It's God. Who's doing the work? It's God. Therefore, let's make sure that we don't try to get our little agenda done. We get God's agenda as a whole church. Amen? He mentions envies and murders. And then he says this. It's interesting. I'm almost finished. He says, and the like. And the like. In other words, this is just what I'm pointing out to you. There, there could be more. <laughs> Watch out. Beware. You think you got the devil beat in one area, he'll back up and come at you from a whole different angle and take you off your feet for God because you, you weren't looking for that. Look at these verses. 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, Jesus who begot, also love him who is begotten. In other words, if you're saved, you make sure that the greatest attribute of your life as a believer is to love other believers. Don't love yourself, love others. Don't seek your good and your, your own, seek others' good and what they need. Be about others, Romans chapter 13, verse 9 and 10. For the commandments are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. We've seen the categories of sin, now the, the conquering of sins. The conquering of sins. Look at verse 22 through 26 and we're done. First of all, the fruit of the Spirit. Let's just overview here. The fruit of the Spirit. Again, it's a singular thing that comes from the Holy Spirit. The works of the flesh are many. They're plural. This fruit is singular, which is saying that, that it all has to come from within and naturally and with God and the Holy Spirit. It's produced only by the Spirit. There's nine qualities that he talks about that lead to the fruit of sanctification. Fruit of sanctification. Notice in those, and then we're, uh, we'll look at a couple verses here, but notice in those, starting at verse 22 and 23, look at those two verses. Notice, the first three of these qualities are related toward our God. The second three reach out to others, how we treat others. And the final three relate to ourselves, which finally leads us to that peace and happiness that we're looking for. Now, Romans 6, verse 11 through 14. He says, likewise, also, here's the secret. Reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The fact is true, but you have to reckon it so. You have, to, you have to act like it's so. You have to believe it's so. You have to behave like it's so. You have to walk in the Spirit. So reckon yourself dead indeed to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, here it is, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments. What's an instrument? An instrument is something that's in the hands of somebody else, be it to make music, be it to, to accomplish a job, a tool. Be instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, you're under grace. In conclusion, when we consecrate ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God and to the work of God, we will have great peace and happiness in our souls 
Peter said in 1 Peter 2.11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. And then our opening verse again, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, wholly, completely. I pray that your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Listen, when we know the meaning of life, it's as we are yielded to this Holy Ghost and then we'll have life and we'll have it more abundantly. Let's pray. Father, help us to be one as you are one in the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Thank you that Jesus always walked. He always brought his, his body, his mind, his mouth, his manners, his all. under the control of the Holy Spirit of God that he was, that was in him, that's now in us who are saved. Thank you that he never sinned. And Lord, help us to want to not sin, but more than just a will, help us to do for it is you who works in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Lord, keep us from following the world and all of the things that bombard us every day. Help us to be quiet and let your spirit speak to our spirit that we are children of God, giving us peace, giving us power over the world, the flesh, and the devil, and even ourselves. With your head bowed and your eye closed just for a moment, if you're here today, or you're listening, you don't have that peace and happiness. You don't, you find that there is this emptiness. Again, you're born with a dead spirit if you're unsaved. And the only way you can ever know God's love and peace and joy, and blessing and meaning and purpose is to be born again, born of the spirit. Just pray this to God. Say, God, I, I confess to you I'm a sinner. Thank you for opening my mind and heart to the truth that I'm dead in sin. I repent of my sin. I don't want my sin, God. I confess it. I turn from it. In my mind, in my heart. Come into my heart and make me alive in the Spirit. Forgive me of my sins because Jesus paid for them with his sinless blood. Save me, God. Lord, I pray somebody asked you to save them and that you, you entered them by your spirit. You, you quickened them. You made them alive in the spirit. And now, Lord, as they daily see this conflict, that they can find the victory in just yielding, reckoning dead, renewing the mind, being transformed as you grow in them by your spirit and your word. Then if you're here or listening and you're a believer, you're saved, you're a Christian, but you find there is conflict when you start to try to do what's right and do what God wants you to do. There's a conflict. You can't get the victory by your own will or strength you have to just keep turning from your old self putting it off 
putting on the new person, reckoning dead the old and believing and yielding to God's word by God's power and God's spirit. Pray this, say, say God, I, I, I thank you for saving me. I'm, I'm alive by the spirit. Oh God, I long to walk in the spirit, with the spirit. I long for that fellowship that you want with us, why you made us and what, you, what it means to be alive. Make me alive, God, for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Lord, I pray that somebody prayed that too and help us all as we seek to walk in the Spirit, be consecrated, sanctified, fit for your use. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you and thank you for coming. Have a good week. Thank you, Dave.